All right. Okay. This is, you know, class is in session. This is Academia Giallo for the month of uh, April. At barely squeezing in yes, well the month done. of April, this year of our Lord 2023, as they say. Uh, we're talking about the black belly of the tarantula. Um, it is a giallo movie, as we would come to expect, talking here on Academia Giallo. Um, it came out in 1971 or two. It's one of those things I can never figure out which year it came out because there seems to be differing opinions. Yeah. Uh, and it was also directed by Paolo Cavara, a director that I'm not familiar with. Although the star of the film, uh, Giancarlo Giannini, I've seen many, many times in, in other films. Yeah. Uh, but I've never seen him dubbed into a weird, flat American accent like this before. And I got to say, I miss hearing his lovely accent. Yeah. Um, so we as we were talking before we went live, guys, uh, the person <laughs> who recommended this uh, <laughs> this episode is not with us right now. Um, maybe he'll come dashing into class uh, once we see we're on. But uh, yeah, so who are we? I'm Ian Simmons of Kicking the Seat. We have uh, Aaron Christensen of Horror 101 with Dr. AC and John Kitley of Kitley's Crypt back with us. Um, we also have a, uh, a guest spot or a comment. I, I got too many mice going on today. Um, from hey, Jonas, Jonas. Hallberg. Hey, hi guys. Hi Jonas. How you doing? Um, so yeah, we are going to talk about this, uh, this movie. I am, I, you know, I've watched it. Of course I took three pages of notes. Um, I am, this is one of the, one of these rare films where I am going to be, uh, prepared to be, uh, turned around, educated, brought to see the light because yeah. I feel like we've talked about a few films where, for me, they don't come together until like the last spectacular five minutes. And this is definitely the case. But I feel like even more so, I was spent the hour and a half watching this film wondering what I was doing watching this film. That's so funny to me, Ian, because I mean, Brian's not here to defend himself. So but I was <laughs> I was I was hoping that he would be here so that I could say nice job, Brian, because, you know, the last I think the last one that he he suggested I was kind of down on. Or he was down. I mean, anyway, wait. Uh, hold on a second. Hold on. There's oh, someone knocking is. at the door. Yes, get in here, <laughs> Brian. Welcome, sir. Um, I don't know if you heard that my preamble. I was there. just. I was just saying, Brian, that I'm. I'm really glad that you're here because uh, I was glad that you recommended. Are you like? Is your is your is your computer on top of like a a washing machine? No. Why does it sound crazy? You sound a little crazy. Okay. Me. So I'll I'll finish waxing your car while you fix your mic. <laughs> and this is a family uh, show, none of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's waxing another thing. Oh so, okay. but but because uh, I was down on I was down on Brian having chosen whatever that movie was, but I was like, Black Belly, good call, because I had not seen it before. And really? I, I was surprised. Yeah, I was surprised by that as well, because I thought I had seen it. But I was surprised that Ian wasn't digging on it from the get-go, because from the jump. It starts off at a massage parlor, and I'm like, Barbara Boucher. Your, I'm like, there's your sleaze, Ian. There you go. And then the murders. The murders are pretty, oh. pretty hardcore. You know, you got the you got the needles and you got the gutting. And you know, I'm like, I'm like, Ian, what do you want? In fact, if anything, I would say that it kind of doesn't deliver all the way through to the end. Like it it starts off hot and then kind of cools off a little bit as we go through our inspectors, you know, existential crisis. Well, the, the the whole reason why I, I even recommended this film is because number one, I love um, Tallini, um, mm -hmm, the character mm -hmm. of Tallini in the film. Like, if there's ever a movie that I like, a Jalo movie that I wish had more films for. Her. Uh, did you freeze, Brian, or is that me? Uh oh, it's it's Brian is frozen. Okay. Brian, we'll, you're frozen. I don't we'll know if he can hear us. He can't hear us. We'll return to our, our Tallini. Uh, well, before I do that, I want to pull over just a second and welcome Big Swifty. Says, Yay! ciao, gents. Big hey, Swifty. great to have you on board. Um, so, yeah, sorry. So you go ahead and we'll hopefully get Brian back on in a second. But anyway, so actually, I'm going to throw a ball back to you, Ian, because so this didn't this didn't grab you. Mm -mm. Now, folks, if you're. Since you're watching here, we got a few people live. Oh, looks like Brian's back. But I'll just briefly say we have the spoiler tag on because my concerns with this movie um, 
are from the very beginning. I am all about like uh, scenes with beautiful women receiving full body massages um, and, and you know playful shadows and camera work. But when I saw that the masseuse was a blind guy, I'm like, there's the killer. Um, <laughs> a blind masseuse. I don't understand how that works. Oh, it works because he's not really blind. He's playing all these people. And uh, that then then the next hour and 28 minutes happened. Um, the last five minutes, as I mentioned, I thought were pretty spectacular. There were some things that I liked about this film. And we'll get into you know, what it's about and all that stuff. I don't want to say I hated it. But I was frustrated throughout, partially because of the filmmaking technique, partially Ooh. because this is the first time I've heard an Ennio Morricone score that I couldn't stand. But oh, I man. don't. Wow. But listen, I am not going to I'm not going to put that down to Morricone. I'm going to put that down to uh, the use of the score in the movie. And I don't know if it's the levels were cranked up in the mix, but his like everything was so oppressive that I felt like I was watching one of those horror movies where they're unconfident in the material, so they have to have the soundtrack do the work for them. Mm. I was like, I get it. You're in an apartment alone. You're going upstairs, but it doesn't have to be so menacing because I know exactly what's going to happen, even though the character doesn't. So, Brian, now that we are back with us, before we wait, lose wait, you again... Hey, hang on. I'm, like, Do I seem spotty or whatever? Like, the, No, the I, I, you, I can tell you washed your face this morning, so let's Your move reputation on. is spotty, uh, no. but... <laughs> In punctuality. <laughs> wow. Hey. You no are, bullying in class. That's for recess only. You're, you're, you're good. I, I can see you. Yeah. Okay. You're moving and grooving. It's great. So yeah. when, when did I cut off like my incessant rant? rant totally, uh, you were talking about uh, Tallini and, and you you're were like, about you to fanboy you, you wish you had more movies that had Tallini in them. Yeah, like more installments of his character um, solving other crimes or whatever. But um, I agree. I, I honestly, so I recommended this film because I felt like we were in dire need of just like a like a true blue um, Jallo film that has all the elements that has Barbara Boucher and all these 007 connections or whatever. Yes, um, a whole different like uh, perspective on how the killer is. Um, you know, because we're used to the black glove killer, but this is a killer that does things on a different level. Um, and and it's got the the <laughs> which I wish there were more of these and these films or whatever, the way that the killer prepares before he goes out, you know, like, I just love that shit. Um, and I thought like, here's me like assuming, and you know, we, we know what happens when you assume that it's a beautiful score, amazing uh, presence, like in the film, like in terms of all the different actors, um, you know, you, you got your red herrings, you got, uh, your methodical murders. Um, it, it's just, I, I thought it was jam packed with all kinds of amazing Jallo shit. So I was like, you know what? Black Belly of the Tarantula. It's a brain, a no brainer. And then I, I, I stumble into this, you know, show and, and it's like, wait, wait, what, did this, what, did, what are they talking about here? Like, what's going on? <laughs> in, in fairness, I am, I'm fully prepared to be the dunce in the corner, the minority on this discussion. So let's, let's talk well, about it. You, you guys go on. I'm going to try something. Cause I, I feel like I'm in like slow motion or something like. Yeah, so you, I'm gonna you, try had a little, you have a little delay in your. Yeah. In your I'm going to try something with the internet. So if I get off and then come back on. That's what happens. It could also just be the lewds. Um, Kitley, I mean, John, jump in here. <laughs> what do you think of Black Belly of the Tarantula? Uh, I'm probably somewhere in between. I thought there are moments that I, I mean, that opening, if there's ever a film that's going to get your attention, it's this film. Um, th the, the reveal at the end was kind of, really? That's that's where we're going to go. But on the same token, that's not really out of the ordinary for some giallos where it doesn't really all fall into place. Um, I love the fact that uh, Tallini doesn't want to be a cop. Right. So he's the guy that's in charge investigating this. So I thought that was kind of <laughs> cool because in, in like we've seen in a lot of giallos, the, the one investigating technically isn't the police. It's always a bystander or, yeah, or amateur, someone amateur 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 yeah. yeah here we have a different a, take right right here we have the cop but on the same token he just i don't know if i'm cut out for this mm -hmm. i don't know if i want to do this so i really like that angle that at least for me i had never seen before mm -hmm. and that's what i like about you know the struggle of like Tallini, like you know with his 
with his girl, with everything that's going on personally. Like I, I like that this film has all kinds of different elements. There's all kinds of different stories going on in the peripherals, you know, like he fucking solves a, a drug smuggling case for Christ's sakes, you know? Um, <laughs> so I, I feel like it's got all these different elements. It's like really well written, I think. And, um, you know, it's, it's the, it's almost like a, an Italian horror cinema cliche where you have like these blind uh, contacts or whatever, you know? So I, I just took it as that when I first watched it, because I watched this years ago, when I was getting into Italian horror and I just noticed like, Oh, the beyond has a blind girl. Uh, there's a blind person here. There's a blind, you know, and then like he, uh, this individual shows up and I'm just like, Oh, it's just part of the culture or whatever. I don't fucking know. But, yeah, uh, Italy, Italy like had a lot of lead, <laughs> lead in the water. So, like, yeah. Half the population went blind. <laughs> but I just, I, 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 I love this film <laughs> from the moment that I cast my eyes on Barbara Boucher's beauty and you know like like I just I I got this movie for me is easily so easy to get swept away in because it's just it's got so much going on I think like I don't think it's boring in any sense of the, the word um there's so much you know even like when you when you kind of hop off the murder express and just kind of get into Tolini's personal life you know at home like, why the fuck did she sell all the furniture? Like, what's going on? Like, this poor dude just wants to sit down and have a fucking J and B or whatever, you know. Like, I just I love that stuff. So that's why I recommended the film. I will say that was something that I don't feel like, and keep me honest here, but what we've seen a lot, or maybe at all, in the jelly that we've talked about is a detective or the person who assumes the role of the detective in the murders with a functional home life. Mm -hmm. You know, usually there's, uh, you know, someone gets is, is murdered or there's infidelity or there's just unhappiness because you're always out, you know, you know, chasing these people. Um, he had a, a, a solid home life. Yeah. And I know I'm jumping way ahead here, but I wouldn't be surprised if I can't remember who wrote seven. I know Fincher directed seven, um, you know, many, many years after this. Oh, but right. there, this yeah. definitely has a seven uh, ending where yes. you've got the the innocent wife i mean gwyneth paltrow in that movie was much more concerned about her husband's occupation mm -hmm. and, and sad because she was kind of alone in a new city and everything whereas the uh the girlfriend here is pretty much content i mean she's she like works as a window dresser in a department store or something she's you know a very artistic person she loves her her man um they have a very affectionate relationship that he also guards very personally and i i feel mm -hmm. that coming across but at the end when the killer decides to go after her to get at the detective who's pursuing him we think that she's dead and that drives him into yeah. a murder frenzy where i think he was just thinking i'm just going to solve this case bring this guy to justice but in that moment it's the head in the box thing he sees right. her on the bed and she's non-responsive and he doesn't quite put that together that she could still be alive you know he goes and kills her and we get those wonderful flashes of the other uh, you know, murder scenes that he's been part of or, or, or seen. And yeah, it just culminates in what I, yeah, it's a spectacular ending. Um, my, yeah, I, I may just need to watch this again because again, the actual film making itself, I found to be kind of uneven and, and weird. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot like the, the scene where the one model is in the, I guess the kind of the dressing room with all the mannequins, I, I've we've talked about scenes involving, you know, people being trapped in these kind of like wardrobe closets with mannequins before. This might be the worst filmed one I've ever seen, where it's literally just, you know, we see her kind of looking around, but the camera is like shaking and wobbling and like nobody's head moves that fast. I don't care how, how panicked they are. There are random shots of, you know, scenery outside. I'm like, this all feels like B-roll that was shoved into an actual movie. Um, there is the, uh, oh, the scene towards the end where uh, Tolini goes to talk to his girlfriend and he visits her at the department store. He's kind of like outside the window. I think she comes out and they're talking on the street in the middle of a sentence. Like they're doing the, the cutting back and forth between the two people talking as we see all the time. At one point, Tolini's talking. It cuts back to her. We should see her on the street, but it picks up. They're out in the middle of the woods walking around. I've seen this technique before, but not usually in mid-sentence. So I'm supposed to believe that, like, so what do you think of this? 
hey, let's go out to the woods. Uh, drive you know, an hour later or whatever to get to the secluded area. Going to get out of the car and go walk around. Hey, remember, we got to pick up exactly where we were mid-sentence an hour ago. It's a creative flourish, but again, it's part of this disorientation. There are so many scenes in this movie that felt like almost these composite scenes like B-roll that they had cut together for a pitch deck for the movie they would eventually film. I cannot defend any of that, but I would say that, yes, it's clear that the, our director, um, Paulo Cavalla, Paulo Cavalla, uh, is that who also, I, well, I'll, I'll divert back to my, my, my diversion in a second. Uh, but I, I think he, I mean, he loves doing those snap zooms. He yeah. loves doing focus pulls, you know, back and forth between, you know, different uh, levels of the frame. This is 1971, mind you. <laughs> yep, and that's to say he's he's really kind of playing with he's playing with the form. He's playing with mm -hmm. you know like what you can do with this the, the storytelling language. And I you know like some of it I agree, some of it's successful, some of it isn't. Some of it just calls attention to itself. But he's also, and I didn't realize this, he's one of the co-directors of Mondo Kane. Mm -hmm. from 1962 so which which is a groundbreaking documentary that launched you know numerous uh you know uh followers uh, kind of like uh cash in efforts uh and i didn't realize it's also an oscar nominee cuz Riza Ortolani did the did the score and it was nominated for best original song mondo kane was mm -hmm. so i was like this is cool. What a fun little rabbit hole. Meanwhile, back at our film, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I don't think that our, I don't think our director did much else in the way of Giallo. So this may have just been his kind of like dabbling in the genre and seeing what he thought of it. And like Brian, I actually, I liked it quite a bit. Uh, I think the first half hour is kind of straight ahead Giallo. And then it becomes something kind of, it becomes a little more of a character study. Mm -hmm. you know, with, with a few murders tossed in along the way. Uh, but I agree that I think the ending is so powerful because we are invested in Tellini at that point. And we actually have like a genuine sense of loss yeah. when we think that his wife is, uh, has been murdered and yeah. we're watching him just like actually deal with it. And we're also just, we're blessed to have such a great actor in Giannini you know, like he's a he's a great actor, Oscar nominee from 1977. You know, mm -hmm. like he's legit, and so to have him as kind of like our vehicle that we're following, right, is right. is really helpful to the film as overall. The the way that he bitch slaps the killer at the end <laughs> is just <laughs> oh, acting at its best. You know, no, no but I, I totally it, agree. I will I, I will jump in and say that Kavala also did Plot of Fear later on, which is sometimes okay considered like Jalo or whatever it's discussed in the Jalo realm or whatever but um yes like i i think i cannot agree with you guys more where like it's you know i, I feel like maybe if he went on to do more of these films he probably would have you know just sharpened his craft or whatever but you could just tell that he's playing with all these different things in this like you know genre that was really popular at the time um so I don't fault any. Well, I, it's not that like I don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I just I look at this film for all the amazing stuff in it, and not necessarily like its flaws here and there, you know. And it it might be just you know first time watcher syndrome, um, mixed again with four a.m. syndrome. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, why do you watch I'm... these movies at four a.m. in the morning? <laughs> because that's when I can. And you um... can't watch you can't watch it at four a.m. at night. That's true. Although some people might say, you know, four o'clock at night. I've, I've heard that before. Yeah, but you um, said 4 a.m. in the morning. So. Yes, I know. It, John's getting, been waiting to say talking something. Talking about rabbit holes. I, I yes, can't John. wait to hear <laughs> what he has us, to say. Tell us why we're all wrong somehow. That'd be interesting. Well. <laughs> Here we go. Here no, we go. Professor no, no, no. yes. No, I was going to. Um, and then let's all interrupt him. That'll be great. <laughs> He's so pissed. Oh no! <laughs> Did he freeze? Oh no! No! Right. No, he didn't. Just so inside, you, just in his heart. Uh, that, that's that stopped beating months ago. Yes. Um, to Ian, you made the comment as far earlier as far as uh, Tallini's good relationship with his wife. Is Am I his, the only wife or girl? His wife. It's okay, his wife. wife. Sure. All right. Yeah. Am I the only one that picked up on that? didn't seem like a perfect because at first I'm thinking 
she had something wrong with her because he comes home and oh i sold the furniture and he's like oh okay and well, that's there was I just a couple it. of parts in the beginning where it seemed like he just kind of went oh uh, oh okay dear yeah right yeah but there's a difference between that being a problem in their marriage and i just got that she was kind of it's one of her no. idiosyncrasies. Yeah, she's yeah. an artist. She's kind of flighty. Right. He didn't go in and start like yelling at her, or he didn't, right. you know, he pimp slap her the way he did right. the killer at the end. Mm -hmm. No, but <laughs> my, my my point is, th to me, that wouldn't be a perfect relationship. No, no, no. He's just no, going, no, no. Yeah. Uh, okay, you set the house on fire. Oh, okay, let's yeah. move then. No, I would agree that it's not it's not a perfect marriage, but it felt real. It yes, felt like yes. these yeah. are two people who, yeah. who care about each other. Like, exactly, they care about mm -hmm. each other. They are not, you know, they are not perfectly aligned in all of their their belief systems, but they just, you know, they love each other, and so they're going to make it work. And yeah. and, it and cements, also, it cements the whole notion of why he reacts the way that he does at the end, because you you could get a sense oh, no. that he truly cares about her. I, I wasn't. I wasn't. Her, you know? I wasn't trying to say that they didn't have a, a loving relationship. It just mm -hmm. didn't seem. It seemed weird. It seemed yeah. off. Yeah. And, yes. and which also made it, uh, a pl or made it uh, go into the his decision that maybe he doesn't want to be a cop. It made it. It made me feel like he's questioning his life. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I he's agree. struggling. He's struggling. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, very much so. It. But I don't. I didn't get the sense that she was one of those kind of existential crises. Like, what am I doing with her? Um, right. She, if anything, felt almost like an anchor. Like he was mm -hmm. drawn to wanting to be with her and, you know, the wacky thing with the furniture and staying home in the afternoon and making love and, and all this other stuff. She represented the sort of the softer, nicer path of life rather than going and investigating, you know, grisly murders or just you right. know, con you know, being a, a beat cop or a detective, whatever he was doing. Um, so, yeah, th that was nice. And... The more I think about it, because I want to bring up something else that I that something I did love. Uh, there was a pretty spectacular foot chase um, yes! up, up a building and on top of a roof. And it's one of those things where I was taken out of the film, but in the best way, because mm -hmm. I realized as. All right. So just to rewind the tape, what the hell is this movie? About? I was just going to say, we is it too late for a synopsis at this point. <laughs> Hey, we're only we're 23 <laughs> minutes in. That's the perfect number. Uh, AC, why don't you why don't you help us out? What's this movie about? Uh, well, there is a there is a murder, a string of murders happening where the victim is pierced in the back of their head with a a, a silver needle. I don't, I don't know if it doesn't have to be silver, just a needle, uh, a needle, and then we find that the victims have been gutted, you know, uh, with a a sharp blade. And Tallini is kind of following. It starts off with Barbara Boucher's character being the first one who's murdered. Spoiler. Um, mm -hmm. And she's married to a businessman who immediately becomes our primary suspect. But then we see other murders occurring that are not necessarily connected to him. So we start going, okay, was that a red herring or not? And also the husband is trying to conduct his own investigation on his uh, separately from Tallini. Uh, Tallini being our, our main uh, inspector. So we've got this string of murders happening, all of which seem to be the work of a single person. And they all have the same MO, but trying to connect the dots as to why they're all happening and who's committing the murder, that's the whole point. And the title comes from uh, a wasp apparently will sting a tarantula or some sort of prey and then put its larva inside the body so that the larva can feed upon the corpse uh, as they are growing. Also, uh, really gruesome. But the idea that the victim is still alive, the victim is still awake and conscious and aware of what's happening, which my head just like went, what? That sounds horrible. I don't ever want that to happen to me. <laughs> well, especially because... It's implied that they're awake for, you know, watching themselves be eviscerated. Yeah. Yeah. It's unclear if they can feel it. They just can't react or move. They're, they're right. stunned. The other thing is whenever this thing wears off, it, talking about the tarantula is not necessarily the people. They, there's not much you can do about, you know, bugs and larvae and stuff growing inside <laughs> of you. So that's got to suck. It just like explodes right. out of you at some point. Right. You're like, thank like, you. Thank you. Yeah, Wash. like that guy in the, <laughs> the mist. The gift that keeps oh. on giving. Ugh. 
See, that's, um, but, the, that's <laughs> let me let me let me insert something real quick, like the knife. Hey, I in see the back, in the back of the knife. Whoa, yeah. John. Whoa, buddy. That's uh, <laughs> the whole fact that they're paralyzed. The minute the knife goes in them, yeah. Whether they were paralyzed or not, it's yeah. still the same. Yeah, so it it's not you. like it's not like oh, I I paralyzed you, so you're gonna stay alive longer as I gut you. No, yeah. you're gonna be dead inside of a few seconds anyway, because. And the and the other, if I remember correctly, Barbara Boucher was cut like in her kind upper rib yeah. and went down. Yep. So he somehow sliced through those ribs pretty yep. easily. And well, she was a model, what, so she probably didn't eat a whole lot. You know, yeah, kind that's of right. brittle, she had her ribs removed. Bones. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's where I kind of got a little lost on the connection with the whole wasp and the tarantula. He's not right. impregnating. He's not. Nope. He's just slicing them. Yep. It's a cool it. title for a movie. It, it is, is an <laughs> awesome title for a movie, but it's kind of like going, kind of like Ian, you had said, as far as some of the camera tricks looked a little over the top or a little obvious. Yeah. That whole thing went, that makes no sense. Well, I, I, well, in terms of making sense, I mean, we, if we fast forward to the end, because the explanation is yeah. like, what? Yeah. Wait, that's that's like the most vanilla response. Oh, he's a uh, clearly psychotic, and you know that's what led him to commit murder. You're like, well, no, wait, it was the that's impotence. It? it was the impotence that made him psychotic, and then drove him to commit again. Murder. It's like, wait, why does he want to do the thing with the needle and the anyway? Uh, but however, well, I because do that wanna... represents the plunging, you know, the the plunging the needle in and the speaking impotence. of plunging, I'd like to insert within John's insertion. <laughs> Because wow, we gotta get we got a gangbang, guys. The the video, the video that they show the wasp killing this tarantula. I'm like, that's not an actual tarantula in the video, guys. Where's the but fuzz? Then, yeah, but then uh, but then there is a tarantula later that gets violently murdered by and Tallini. If I may insert into please, your insertion please. of you know, John's insertion, more 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 the barrier. <laughs> DP um, no longer means director of photography. <laughs> oh. All right, what? <laughs> that tarantula was referred to as being from the Orient, where it's actually a pink. To it's a it's a South American pink toe right. that I used to own several of. So I was like, I saw that. I was like, that's not from the Orient, guys. <laughs> when but you anyway. finally get a tarantula, it's not even the right tarantula. I thought Brian was going to say that tarantula went on to write one of the follow up. <laughs> 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 well, considering that uh, that when Cellini meets the scientist who like shows him the film of all that stuff and eventually attacks him, um, <laughs> but okay, he's got the he takes the tarantula out of the glass cube, and then Cellini's like looking at the glass cube because it's apparently full of cocaine, and then the scientist just has these giant forks, and he's literally just like bringing it closer and closer <laughs> to his neck. I'm like, did you honestly think that was gonna work, dude? And then he just like. He failed, he's a he scientist. He's a killer. He's a scientist. He's, he's, he's new at this, I guess. But what I loved is that you know, uh, Tallini is like, "That's not that's not sand that the tarantula is on." Yeah, it's cocaine. I'm like, okay, now we have a sequel to Cocaine Bear, Cocaine Tarantula. That's just, that tarantula is on fire. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, here's the other thing. Like this whole i feel like most of this movie is red herrings and when i finished it i was like you could have boiled this whole thing down to a tight gruesome 30 minute short because there's so much business no. and as you mentioned i think oh. ac in between uh, earlier like the murders are kind of peppered throughout and they're all very similar it's all you know model gets cornered in dark room thing shoved in the back of her neck and then eviscerated there's no variety to it. Like as soon as the lights go out or as soon as she looks in that creepy stairwell, I'm like, I know what I'm in for for the next five minutes, bad camera work, screaming <laughs> and the needle. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's just something that all that stuff about the cocaine, like the, the drug ring person. The first person said, Oh, this person was killed because she was uh, a nymphomaniac. And the second right. victim was involved in a drug smuggling thing or, or whatever. I'm like, what is does any of this have a through line and at the end it turns out no there was no connection to no, no. anything it was all just red herrings it's, See, but it's you're like Tallini, you know you're frustrated because there doesn't seem to be any connection to any of these it's, i shared the frustration life. with the detective huh 
Well, okay, Giancarlo Giannini has famously sad eyes, right? Mm. And it's interesting to see like what I can consider to be the baby face version because that, this is the earliest of his films I think I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, and he's got, the, first of all, for some reason I thought he looked a lot like Daniel Radcliffe with a mustache and I was, you know, all for it. But those sad eyes, they you could construe that as like malaise or boredom. And throughout most of this picture, I was like, I'm right there with you, guy. I don't know what <laughs> any of this has to do with anything. At the third act, they introduce, I guess, the top model at the agency talking to, is it Barbara Bach, the one who gets it in yes. the, yeah. okay. Um, all of a sudden, they're having these really conspiratorial, revelatory conversations. I'm like, this is the first time we've seen either of these characters in the movie and they're develop they're delivering all this important information. I'm like, I don't think this film knows what it is at all, which is fine, I guess. <laughs> I'm sitting in the back of the class, wait, you know, raising my hand, like, pick me, pick me. And and you guys are like, no, we're talking Shakespeare. You're asking questions about, you know, exactly. hop on pop. I can't, I, I can't, again, I can't defend it, but yeah. it was because, because it was different that I was able, I, I was on, I was on board because it, it, there was, there was some novelty to, and again, I actually, the, like the camera movement, it, it, as I said earlier, it doesn't, it doesn't always fit, but I like that. It's like, here, I'm going to keep you interested. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah, throw yeah. a different plot point in. I'm going to do some wacky, you know, handheld stuff. Um, can we, can we dial back though, way back to the beginning? Because you were like, you didn't like the Morricone score. And I can't I, tell I, if I liked it or not, because it was just so in my face the entire time that I'm like, I'm, I'm just hearing obnoxious music. Well, I mean, see, for me, like I was hearing the the size and the moaning. Oh, don't get of, me started on the size. I no. have to get you started on the size because that was that was kind <laughs> of, you know, like the, that's the motif for the entire film. So how I, can we not talk about the size? I get it, to mention, I'm sending it back. Is, this is a collaboration between Mark him and, uh, and Nikolai. Uh, Nikolai. Yeah. yeah, like it's it's just, uh, I don't know. I, I think when, when I hearken back to this film, right, like in, in my, whenever it's brought up in conversation, that's the one thing that I often go to is just like, oh my God, I love that soundtrack. Like I love how just dreamy and just it takes you away to the sensual, like almost personal place or whatever. And and then like, meanwhile, the whole, uh, just the, the way that the killer kills people, it's just so like opposite <laughs> of the, the score. Like I just, I love that juxtaposition. Well, and if I can throw something in, because I made the, the Mondo Kane reference earlier mm. with Riz, Riz Ortolani, who is famous for that right. beautiful score that yes. over, over uh cannibal Holocaust. Yep. And I was yep. immediately, I was like, it's that same, same thing, right? Like, yeah. So yeah, I'm saying it's yep. like with the gruesome, the gruesome, you know, like needle and evisceration. AC, and, AC, AC, I think I'm falling more in love with you. During I know. Well, after we've had these, <laughs> we've had a rough patch over the past couple episodes. I know. <laughs> I, I, I can leave you guys alone. Um, Please don't. No, I, <laughs> But here's the oh, thing, like funny. even the size, it it strikes me as a stylistic choice that is just so intrusive in so many parts of the film. Like when uh, Tallini is just I can't think of specific examples, but I, I knew when I was watching it, there's a scene where Tallini is thinking about something or I think he had just come from murder scene or something. And you hear that. Ah, I'm like, no, that what? outside Wait, the that, context of the movie can, why do the size you, make any sense there it's not like it's again? the voice yeah. huh can you do that again <laughs> <laughs> i know it's I, I all i have to do is like imagine a come comely young lass whoa, whoa, yawning whoa. and that's me <laughs> during most of this i thought that was going somewhere else <laughs> comely uh. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Can I also? I'd like to. I like to throw in because I. I took. I said I took notes. Uh, I did the, too. I, actually, the I, idea. I, the idea because there's this. There's this photo <laughs> that plays heavily into the opening part of the investigation, where it's a nude photo of Barbara Boucher mm -hmm. and another 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 man who is not her husband, and there's a little. There's a like a thing in the photo. It's right behind her head. And they're all like, oh, "What is that? What is that?" And they analyze and analyze and they find out it's the, uh, it's a jet that's seen through the picture window behind her. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they say, do you think you can figure out what the location of this, of this apartment <laughs> is based on 
that one jet behind your head and the one and the guy goes yeah yeah it'll take a little while but i was like i think i can i was like italian police are so amazing oh, oh my god seriously so i i i eat that shit up like it's just i was like wait one plane from one window you're gonna you can do that these guys are awesome he was gonna zero zoom in get the get the uh the, the serial number. number the serial yeah. number on the yeah. jet <laughs> Reference, find out the coordinates yeah, yeah exactly it, it's it's pretty <laughs> simple it. it's, it's just work pretty, really i mean that's the thing like it's i was so confused by that because it's just <laughs> her and this guy against a completely white yep. background and there's yep. like this little detail I'm like that could be a sticker on a wall where are you it getting could. this <laughs> but it's not if, if you figure there's what one plane taken out of italy a day it's, <laughs> it's, so it's easy to time that it's just the one and yeah. the angle yeah. sure yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, just look at the look at the 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 way that the sun reflects off the nipple in the photograph, and you'll be able to tell align that with the plane. And Ian, you made a reference earlier about the 007 connections, or was that you, Brian? I think it was um, Brian. I, yeah. yeah, I, I, you know, mentioned. Well, that. I don't. I mean, I don't know that it's obvious to everybody. So, would you like to elucidate on the uh, the 007 connections? Well, you have uh, Claudine Auger, right? right? Who is in um, Thunderball? Okay. Um, you have Barbara Boucher, who is in uh, Casino Royale, the uh, the spinoff, not the original Broccoli Cannon. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you also have Barbara Bach, who is in The Spy Who Loved Me, and you have Giancarlo Giannini, who is in the first two uh, Casino Royale, or well, the Daniel Craig, the films. Daniel Craig films, yeah, yeah. Like, and we have an amazing foot chase, as Ian referred to, oh. which harkens back to Casino Royale, yes, where I'm just yes. like, holy shit, that's those two actors, and they're running on the edge of a roof, and Jesus Christ. The, and, and the thing is, it's it's the roof, it's almost like a, like an infinity pool. There's not like guardrails or no. like a wall it's or something, like a half-height wall. <laughs> it's so dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> but that's why I was saying, I was watching it taken out of the film like, I would, you know, just being on set, I would feel like I'm watching an action movie because these guys, and they're not like stopping and there's not a lot of cuts. I mean, there's no. these aerial shots of them just like running around corners on a roof that has no safety rails. Yep. And then when the husband takes that, you know, beautiful nosedive, I mean, I know it's a, it's a crappy dummy, but they got yeah. the flail just right on that thing to the uh -huh. point where he bangs his head like in a window on the way uh -huh. down and then continues and like, his flop. Yeah, it was so good. Yeah. Um, and, and that's and, what I that's what I'm saying. Like this film has so many like amazing like the, the way that um when um Tallini, right? Like he's getting in his car and then he gets like an assassination attempt or whatever. And like the way it happens is like holy shit. <laughs> like, you know, like I don't know. Like I, I think this movie there's a lot of parts where it just it, it goes for it, you know. Well, I think they, maybe that's it, Ian. Is that, and I would probably concur with you that as a as a cohesive whole, it's not. It maybe doesn't tie together, but I feel like there's enough. There was enough in interesting ingredients throughout that I was like, yeah, I would I would eat there again. Mm -hmm. Look, yep. here, we're, we're done talking Lovely about way of Barbara Boucher. Easy, um, okay. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Leave it to Ian. That, I, I was very big in the fifties with that show. Um, here, here's, here's do, do you example. have a, do you have like an under eighteen uh, button on this episode? Or? You mean over eighteen or whatever? I don't. Yeah, I was like, is this is this video intended for kids? No, it's no, not. And I marked that clearly. Um, but it's okay. Here's the thing that that scene, the assassination attempt, is a perfect example of. One of the, the missing ingredients, I think, from this film, as much as I love Giancarlo Giannini, uh, there is something so removed about this. Maybe it's because he's got a really good home life. He's like, eh, OK, I knew he wasn't in danger for a second. They establish he gets in his car. There's the giant truck with all those beams. And I immediately flashed on Final Destination 2, with that mm. awesome, uh, you know, freeway wreck. But I'm like, OK, so the truck is right in front of his car. They're both parked. The truck's going to start and shove those things right through the windshield. Again, I'm watching the movie before any of this has happened. I'm not psychic. It's just very well choreographed. But the problem is I knew he was not in immediate danger because the only way those things can go through a windshield is to completely take out the person who's driving or sitting in the you know, driver's seat. But I know they're not going to kill off the third, uh, the main character, you know, 
right at the beginning of act three. So See, I'm like, okay, I, he ducked down. He hold on. He gets out of the car. He walks up to the cab of the truck and there's nobody in there. Surprise, surprise. But he doesn't, he doesn't have any kind of reaction. He just like kind of looks and like, and then, like, I want to see some humanity. I want to see someone saying, oh my God, I just survived the, the, by the split second think, you know, my wits ducking down at the right moment as this thing came into my car. And then I get out and like, okay, who did this? Oh my God, the person's missing. Am I still in danger? Is my girlfriend in danger? What does this all mean? Instead, he's just like that sad, ad life. He's like, just another Thursday. We are missing. That's that. why he doesn't want to be a cop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, every so that's, Thursday that's, that's, that happens that's, every that's, day. That's the stuff of a comedy, though. That's not something when I'm trying to get invested in, like the danger of this, you know, that this character is in. Plus, you're but, wrong. But, you're wrong, Ian, in thinking that major characters cannot be killed off at any point in that's, these movies. That's what I was about to say. Because it happens all the time. With right, Barbara this, Boucher's character, that's introduced. Right, like, like that's I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah, like exactly. It, it felt like a very psycho kind of thing where it was right, like no, but, you introduce but, okay. this character and then she's like almost immediately killed off and you're like, okay, now who can I trust? Like who can I confide in in terms of putting my like movie watching experience? Who do I invest in? You know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's it, a it, difference. That there, There's a difference and I'll say, and this isn't, I'm not going to say this is sexist or I'm not trying to be sexist when I say this, but there's a difference between... So you're like, totally being sexist. Well, no. <laughs> but I'm saying in these kinds of movies, which, you know, were put out and, and we've had examples of kind of like breaking this convention, but typically you've got the, you know, the women are in trouble and there's the the guy detective or detective type who's trying to solve the murder and, and you know, figure everything out. Um, it's less surprising I'm not surprised when the woman we think is going to be our lead suddenly ends up dead, right? There's a difference between that happening in the first 15 minutes of a movie and us getting an hour and five minutes into an hour and a half movie with our main character detective and thinking he might, might, he might not make it out of this because I'm going to cite Roger Ebert's law of the economy of characters, which doesn't exactly apply here, but it's close. Like if you take out the guy who's the main character, who's left to care about or solve the murder, unless but, they go back but, and like the girl, the wife that he, you know, the artist wife is somehow thrust into this and she has to solve the mystery. That'd be interesting. But Janini, you know, Tallini, Janine, Janine Tallini, I like that name. There you go. Uh, there's no, there's no way he's in danger. Maybe injured, but, but not taken out. But you should know, Ian. Like we've been watching these films enough, like um... for years. Yes. <laughs> yeah technically um but like anything can happen at any given moment like that that example is done um and, and i you know it, it might be considered inferior to this film but i i look at them both equally i i love that film um the um <laughs> the film that i can't think of right now the, the like, title. Is it <laughs> I'm is on the edge of my seat what's it gonna be <laughs> is it one we've talked about <laughs> um it's the the high heels movie um Death walks on high heels. There you go. Uh, like the the way the um, what you perceive as the main character of the film, uh, she's murdered towards like you know two thirds two thirds into the movie. She's murdered. Yeah. You know, like that. The it could happen. Like it's it's I mean, something the house, the house that you can't dream to de- to live and die in L.A. You know. <laughs> well, but but like, what I'm thinking like you, of, you, okay, you can't here's... wipe that off the table. Like you you, that, you it, can if know. there is if there are other people who could conceivably finish the movie in lieu of our main character right mm-hmm. then you've got that like you know death walks on high heels that was that was the one with the the models in the in the climax in the in the countryside right or am i thinking of a different one that's torso. torso torso damn it i i i remember vaguely what you're talking about but unfortunately i'll run together my question is if Tallini gets taken out in this movie, as you say, anything can happen. I say not everything can happen. I can say some things are 99.99% unlikely to happen. Mm-hmm. But in this case, if Tallini got taken out in that car, who else is around to finish the movie in terms of being a character that we would recognize as deserving to finish the plot? Agreed. However, it's hmm. a cool it's a cool scene. It's a cool scene, but could, would you consider maybe Paolo? the um the disgruntled man that's considered like the guy that was uh that killed uh his wife obviously and then he, it would be no. the well he's dead already by that point, at right? that point he's yeah. dead at that point okay I, it's I the just... guy that's going to figure out what plane that was that's right <laughs> there <laughs> you go because <laughs> if anybody could have figured it out 
that That's guy. The guy. He should have been no. on the job to begin with. He Look, here's was. here's here's who I would vote for. I would this would have been my top favorite film of all time had this development happened. You take out Tolini, and the person who finishes the film and solves the murder is the flamboyant concierge guy who's like yeah. working at the modeling agency. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when he goes in to be interrogated, Tolini's like, you know, are you married? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> disgusting. How dare you, sir? I love yes. that guy. Um, uh, I do want to pull over real quick. Sorry, AC, but no, this please. comment came in like at the top of the show, pretty much. Also from Big Swifty. I've got four words for this one. That score, Ennio Morricone. Thank you. All Point caps. Taken. Yes. Um, Fun fact. Jim unless Carlo he was Giannini. addressing Mr. Morricone, he's not on this show. What? If, hmm. if Morricone is, A, that'd be awesome. And B, that'd be weird. And B, that'd be awesome. Um, Giancarlo Giannini dubbed Jack Nicholson for The Shining. The Italian really? release of The Shining. Oh, I thought you meant for the cool, American version. How like, cool that's is that? <laughs> the American version. That would be even better. Actually, he does a better Jack Nicholson impression than Jack Nicholson does. <laughs> Let me in the baba head of my chinny chin chin. <laughs> Here's a Jack. Oh, my God. Here's Giancarlo. <laughs> um, that was terrible. Uh, <laughs> John's and live. And it's out John, I, are you are you thoroughly disgusted by my ignorance? I, jump in here. I, I I can't tell if your silence is From you're just like looking or... up other shows to appear on. <laughs> <laughs> He's just scrolling right now. He is the Tallini of the show. He's like yeah. contemplating. I just, like, I, 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 don't I just wanna... don't know if I really want to do this anymore. Oh. I, I, just, I don't know if I'm cut out for it. I, I think something that is right in the beginning of the movie, almost as apparent as the naked uh, Barbara Boucher. Almost is that, as apparent. <laughs> is that amazing apartment to she? I oh my gosh, her. the decor. Thank the you. The decor. God. The phones, couch, the telephones. The telephone, the artwork that she had. Every, yeah, oh my that God. Is, this is one example where it is obviously dates the movie, yeah. but in a very positive way. Oh, yeah. Mm, You're like, beautiful. there you go. Yeah. People used to have that kind of stuff in their house. Mm -hmm. yep. The decor, I was like, I, I was like, amazing 70s decor, cool ass phones. <laughs> I was like, where do we get phones like that now? I would That's have, part of my notes I would, as well. I would actually. Have phones like that in every room in my house. Hey, uh, AC, what, what are you doing yeah. later? AC, what are you? <laughs> Can we go shop doing? for phones? <laughs> oh, I thought we were just making a love connection. Um, <laughs> I just I don't know I, I'm I adore this film. Um, it's one of those films where like um, I don't watch often, but when I do, I just love like getting soaked into it. Um, I love the way you know it it opens with that amazing, I believe, amazing score and just Barbara Boucher getting massaged by a blind individual, yep. and then it ends with Tallini disappearing into that Italian crowd and then like the little spider web that pops up at the end. Yeah, that was fun. And then, yeah, like everything, the feel of this movie, like I have to disagree in terms of, you know, like picking apart like the camera work or this or whatever. I feel like as you guys mentioned, as um, I guess as a collection of things that you might have learned or you might have like kind of filled your cup with along the journey of watching Jallo, this film kind of repays you in that way, like in terms of like, oh, you like this, you like this, you like this. And I'm not saying it's a greatest hits because it's its own animal, um, especially with Tallini as a center center uh, character. Um, I just love all the elements that come. It's also into this really movie. early in the cycle, you know. If yeah, it's in yeah, 71, yeah. One, you know, like <laughs> it's it's you know, uh, uh, Bird with the Crystal Plumage has just come out, and like 71 is when every body is trying to get in mm -hmm. on that sweet sweet crystal bird money mm -hmm. maybe you know maybe that's it because brian to your point you know we have talked about a lot of these movies over the last several years <clears throat> and one of the one of the problems and i was talking about this with a friend earlier today uh you know putting on that film critic hat you can't turn it off mm -hmm. you know even when you're watching reality television which gets me in a lot of troubles <clears throat> definitely not uh domestic tranquility with my own you know <laughs> with my wife we're watching tv <laughs> or movies she's like just shut up just watch it <laughs> um but th th i've seen other you know films that we've talked about that mm -hmm. i think handle material very similarly but in a more 
uh, refined and exciting sure. way that doesn't seem so random. I, I wasn't kidding when I said there are parts of this film, entire sequences and, and sequences of sequences that feel like B-roll. They're like, OK, and we're going to we're going to almost like animatics like real life storyboards like okay we're gonna go out and get a shot like this and here's the car driving along we gotta go get this but then they just like hey, we, hey look we've already got this we're gonna uh, put it in the movie um the one uh, exception i will make that was stunning i actually rewound and watched that a couple of times during the end when there's the big race back to uh, his apartment mm -hmm. when he realizes that his wife is in danger he's driving through that dark tunnel um, there are some beautiful Tron like bending of those, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. the lights mm -hmm. in the tunnel, these long kind of like spaghetti things twisting around corners mm -hmm. and his face, like the close ups. And you just see the, you know, the kind yeah. of the sweat I was looking. I was looking for that emotion after the attempted murder. But, you know, I'll take what just, I can get. Just another Thursday. <laughs> right, right, seriously. <laughs> but no, I, I think this movie. The, the only reason I want to go back and give it another chance at some point is because Barbara Boucher. No. Oh. The apartment. I was I was more the apartment. Of, no. Oh <laughs> the <I> dog. <laughs> how, wait, first of all, well, look, how old was I'm gonna get like really uh down in the in the gutter here, guys. How old was Barbara Bach during this movie? It was her second film, so was she, she was, of age. I I don't wait, know. What? Was she of age? I don't know that she I don't oh. know that she was or wasn't, but I suspect she was. I mean, she's always been pretty youthful. I mean why Who Loved Me is still another six or seven years out. She was born in 46, so... There you hmm. go. Okay, the, the reason I ask is because mm -hmm. this stuck out like a sore thumb. And it's you know, sometimes it happens in these movies, like everybody who's a woman and sometimes everybody who's a man appears naked. <laughs> She's the exception, I think, <laughs> right, in this right, film. Right. They, oh, but yeah, it's, yeah, it, yeah. But it's the very obvious, like, Austin Powers, we're Which trying to I cover up the nude that. body. Oh, I thought God. it was... I thought it was well done and well staged where you've got she's been paralyzed and kind of rolled over onto her back and the mm -hmm. killer comes up almost like a ceremonial thrusting of the knife. We see him from mm -hmm. the back. His body completely Gorgeous bisects scene. hers in the frame Gorgeous like her scene. legs, his body, her upper torso. But all this all the you know inappropriate stuff is covered up. And I was just I was so self-conscious of it. I'm like, really, this is the one time we're not going to see a naked body. And second of all, I was thinking. Is there a reason for that? Like, right. is it just artistic I, flourish, or is it like, oh, she, we can't. Eh, parents, I think it's because I think it's because it's Barbara Bach, and Barbara Bach. Uh, I don't think she's been nude in films. I, I think she shows off lots of skin, but I don't. I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I haven't seen all of her stuff, but but I feel like she she's a very curvy, but not necessarily uh, someone who you see all. And I mean, she may have just said, cause she's American. She may have mm -hmm. been gone, mm -hmm. gone over there and, and so didn't have the same sensibilities. And I was like, eh, might've been in I, her contract, right? Yeah. That's what I'm <laughs> yeah. thinking. Like it felt, it felt like something that was specific, as you say, Ian specific to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not trying to say that like, Oh, I'm disappointed because I didn't get to see the goods or whatever. It just, it, <laughs> it was, it was another case. It was another case. And I apologize for that, but not really, but I do. <laughs> um, it was much like the rooftop chase. I was pulled out of the film sure. because I'm watching something that is unlike the other material surrounding it. And it yep. just made me wonder, like, why am I seeing what I'm seeing? What's the story there? I'm, I'm right. curious, like, what what are the possibilities? I don't need to know the answer, but it really got me thinking in ways that, frankly, a lot of the story, like the red herrings. I mean, there are entire stretches of this movie that I couldn't tell you why people were going around doing what they were doing. There's like the 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 one guy the bow hunk who ends up getting killed not on the rooftop but in a car hit and run after the rooftop right. he's like going and trying to mail a letter to somebody and i what i don't know i was just frustrated because it was hard for me to to engage with this material um but again i'm prepared to oh, no. say like this is academia giallo uh 102 and i'm still stuck in 101 hey you like what you like that's the other thing yeah, i mean exactly. brian brian exactly. is definitely uh evidence of that that you know there are things that don't hey, necessarily hey, hey, let's keep it friendly no i'm just saying like there are things that don't add up to a good film but you know that there there's enough things in that appeal that you're like absolutely i know that the service is horrible here but i love you know I love this, this, and this on the menu. So there you go. Again, we're done talking about Barbara Boucher and Barbara Bach. Um, so <laughs> never, never, guys. Uh, any closing thoughts on this movie? I've spouted enough nonsense, so I want to hear what you guys have to say. Andrew Kevin Walker was the screenwriter for Seven. Okay, oh, there you go. Who also did Sleepy Hollow and uh, 
few other things. All right. That's what I have Bri to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Brian. Um, I, I don't know if uh, there was a beautiful Blu-ray that came out of this film uh, not super long ago. Um, but I, I just think it's a gorgeous film. I just think, um, you know, the the shots that really get interesting are super memorable. The the score is, I think, amongst the best in, in Jalo. It's it's just such a beautiful, dreamy like this again. score. We'll call it um, we'll call it memorable. How about that? That, that okay. leaves it, uh, <laughs> it non-judgmental. It's got a very memorable killer in it. <laughs> um, I think if you enjoy these films, if you enjoy just the the getting soaked in Italian giallo thing. Um, this film is right up your alley. Um, it's got a a great central character to follow. It's got um, really great uh, nudity <laughs> in the movie. The Barbara <laughs> Boucher is nighty when she gets up to what is that? What the fuck's going? Oh my god! Like I was like, <laughs> things need to be brought back. Um, <laughs> yes, I love it. But like, I just think as. Um, it's amongst the most memorable films in a good, I think in a good way. Um, totally recommended. Just one of those great Italian Jello films. Before I get to you, John, um, I, I was thought of something a little bit ago and I want to mention it before I forget again. Um, I did think one of the artistic flourishes, whether this was deliberate or not, it's just kind of picked up on it. Um, the killer's gloves, they're not black gloves. I know, and they yes. don't seem like, like the flimsy that. latex gloves. They look mm -hmm like mannequin hands yes they yes, look yes, like mannequin yes. hands that are fully articulated yep. and also the models when they are stunned and usually they're rolled over on their back so the killer can do their things but what i'm drawn to is how they look like models of course they're models right that's what they get paid for but they look almost like mannequins they're frozen they're completely lifelike but they're just turned into these objects that are meant to mm -hmm. be you know manipulated and, and cut up in this case so i felt that was kind of a cool thematic connection to the victims and also the killer's kind of aesthetic i don't know that it's really tied together i'm just kind of piecing this you know together for myself but you know it's, mm -hmm. again it's something fun to think about I, I i will say like you know adding on to what you just said that that would probably be my only critique of the film is i wish it delved into the psychological stuff a bit more you know what i mean like just to connect everything together and be like oh not just like a rap at the end of like what what transpired like more into it like throughout the film so you really get a sense of like oh this guy is just so disturbed and tortured you know it's the psycho exposition like literally well, go well, from the ending the, of seven to the ending of psycho yeah, it's the vanilla right? psycho like the yeah. blandest yeah. anyway john john well no there is the the one murder where I don't remember which character it was, but she's running through the studio with all the mannequins, knocking them over and stuff. So right. to your point, Ian, there are those images of the mannequins laying all about. And she was, and she actually was facing away from him. Yep. And he leans over in front of her and slices her up. So that was even different he, than. It looks like he cut her throat or something. Cause when they, the, the crime scene photos, there's like these pools coming out from underneath her or something. Yeah. I don't know. It almost looked like he was reaching yeah, did from like behind and, and came up. But mm. as far as the film, I, I think the, the reason that you need to see it is because, like I think Aaron mentioned, it's early in the history of Giallo. So once you get by probably by 75 or so, um, everybody's playing by the numbers. You got to do this. You're doing this. And I think this was unique that in the early stages, it didn't do that. Yeah, and, and maybe because those weren't set yet, the standards weren't set, right. so they were kind of uh, had that um, that ability to go. We're going to do this. We're going to do this, and it wasn't upsetting anything because it hadn't been laid in in stone, so to speak. But yeah. I think it's mm -hmm. worth it. It's not one yeah. of my favorites, mm -hmm. but I think it's it's highly uh, worth seeing. Definitely, and that context I think is important. You know, it, it, we are not doing this in order it's not like a history class where we start at the beginning of time and work our way up to the present we're kind of bouncing all over and sometimes that's hard mm -hmm. for me to keep in mind like oh this is before a lot of the stuff we talked about or, or vice versa um, by the I way wanna, oh, yeah by the way real quick because it's, it's connected to italian stuff but look what i got Ooh, whoa that's fancy that it's is sweet. Sweet. is that is that custom or is that it's his hoverboard <laughs> <laughs> 
No, it's a it's a company called Graveyard uh, something. Nice shout out. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Please sponsor Sorry. us, Graveyard. Yeah, I was like, don't, no. don't hire Brian to be your spokesperson. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget the title. He'll forget the name of your company. All right. We've uh, got a few more comments just to round this out. Um, Big Swifty says, maybe Ringo didn't allow her to be new. Was Barbara Bach going out with Ringo? He, oh, hadn't, he, hadn't, married. he hadn't met her for 10 more years, but maybe, oh. you know, psychically. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> good to keep your clothes on. He, um, he met her. He met her on the set of Caveman from 1981. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, with Phil Hartman. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Jonas Albright writes in. Has anybody of you guys seen Mannequin in Red from 1958? I have not. Didn't we? No. Did we talk about maybe talking about that? That title seems familiar to me. We saw movies with red mannequins in them. Yes. Okay. And not to be confused with Mannequin from 1986 with Andrew McCarthy. Absolutely not. Oh, well, that's scary in its own right. Um, and then Jonas says Swedish blood and black lace. Swedish? I think that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying is Mannequins in Red is kind of oh. a Swedish blood and black lace. I thought he was implying that there is a version of like a Swedish version of blood and black lace. I'm like, <laughs> I gotta watch that now. Um, but no, that that sounds pretty cool. Uh well, we'll be back talking about something next month. Hey, maybe even Mannequin and Red. I don't know. No promises. We got to work this out with the group. Did, did we already lock something in for next month? No, but did we're we? not going to decide it on air because we know how that turns out. Well, because I, I, so what did, where did $5 <laughs> for the August moon come from then? Right. Uh, Cal, uh, Italy. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. <laughs> no, like, because Bye, I will everybody. tell you. I, no, real quick. I watched that one earlier in the week because I thought yeah. I thought we were doing that for the show. And I was like, wait a minute. Like, what the fuck am I doing? Because I saw the link. Right. And I was like, oh, my God. It's uh, Black Belly of the Trench. <laughs> well, we, should do, we should do $5 for the August moon in, I don't know, August. But uh, we, we'll decide on something for May uh, later. And we'll let everyone know what that is. But in the meantime... Thank you, everybody, for, for hanging out. This has been a really fun class. I feel like I've learned a lot, um, mostly lessons <laughs> in humility and perspective. But uh, <laughs> I am Ian Simmons of Kicking the Seat. We have uh, Aaron Christensen, Horror 101 with uh, Dr. AC. We have John Kitley of Kitley's Crip. And last but not least, but certainly late, <laughs> Brian, Brian Martinez of the Giallo Room. Um, oh, and uh, also Jonas says... Thanks for a great show, guys. Well, thank you, yes. Jonas, and for everybody for who tuned in live and, and whoever watches in the future. If you like this stuff, please like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, please like and subscribe to all the content of my lovely fellow creators. Uh, all their information is down below. And until next time, whenever that is, whatever that is, thanks and class dismissed. <laughs>